Hey guys, I'm Brandon from Sasquatch Beast Studios, and I'm working on a game called Samurado. And this is a really special episode because I'm joined by a YouTuber and fellow game developer, Watt Designs. His name is Matt, and he has a YouTube channel with almost 50,000 subscribers. And his game, Isle Goblin, is actually on the list of most wishlisted indie games on Steam right now. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into it. So Matt, Thank you so very much for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. I know that you're a busy guy. You got a lot on the go. And I'm so, I, I've been watching your channel for a long time. And I love your channel. I love your content. I love your game. It all looks really awesome. So thank you so much for joining me. I'm really ex excited to have you on. Nice. Yeah, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. This will be fun. Yeah, yeah, I will. So just for those people who are listening that don't know anything about you, don't know who you are, don't know what you're working on, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, who you are, what you're currently working on, all that good stuff. Sure. My name is Matt. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer and uh, in my, you know, for my day job, but uh, in my spare time, I've been working on this game called Isle Goblin, uh, where you kind of play as a a goblin whose island is being invaded by humans. Uh, I've always liked the idea of playing as a little monster, so uh, that's kind of the general idea. The game's kind of... I usually describe it as uh, sort of a top-down Terraria, um, kind of like uh, if Terraria had a lot of Stardew elements and was more of a top-down sandbox game. Um, nice. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of it. That's kind of, kind of me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, so... And I'm curious to know if you know, because in the intro just now, I mentioned that you were... Um, on the list of most wishlisted indie games on Steam. And uh, so, and I, I went to the most wishlisted on Steam and I filtered uh, by the indie category and I had to do some really weird crap on Excel in order to actually like figure out what number you are. But based on what I did, and it was like three or four days ago now, but you were number 386 if I calculated it correctly. Um, so I guess I wanna know like, first off, did you know that you were on that list? Uh, no, I've never, uh, I didn't even know you could do that. So, uh, I normally obsess over the wish list count. You've given me something new to obsess over now. I, uh, I'm, gonna, you know, I'm sorry. I'll do that, that now. <laughs> that's okay. Well, so, so no, that's, I had no idea. So that's not the kind of thing that you look at regularly is like going on steam and like, I'm, do you look at your wish lists very often? Like, is that the kind of thing that you obsessively look at? Definitely. Yeah. yeah I'm always looking at the wish lists. <laughs> um, so, um, and for, so for a guy that's making a game by himself uh, in you're working in unity, right? Um, you're, you're doing really, really well, obviously. Like it doesn't matter how far down you are on that list. I think it went up to like a thousand. I want to say J just like the top 1000 people, but anywhere on that list is a really, really huge deal. Um, and I know that a lot of what, what a lot of developers are shooting for is 10,000 wish lists. That's just the number that I hear get thrown around a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So do you have any goals for your ranking, which is currently 386? Um, do you have any just kind of hopes or dreams or wishes as for where that's going to be when you're ready for launch? Uh, you know, ranking wise, I haven't really thought about it, but just raw wish list count. I've been shooting for, it used to be 20,000. Now I'm shooting for about 50. 50. Uh, that's uh, I I don't know, just based on. Is that, oh, yeah, because, is that because you already surpassed your goal of 20? Very recently. Uh, yeah, I never thought I'd make it, but uh, yeah, I managed to, I'm at about 21 right now, uh, hoping for 50. That's, that's kind of the new, uh, the new bar. That's incredible. You're already past 20. So yeah, the, 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 the low bar that I hear, uh, sorry, not the low bar, the main one that I hear get thrown around is 10,000 for most developers. And you've already doubled that. And now you have a goal of, you know, doing five times what other people want. That blows me away. Um, so Congratulations, by the way. That's a really big deal. How long do you think before do you have like a an estimation in terms of when you think the game's going to be released? Um, honestly, not really. Uh, I've just kind of been going as fast as I can and just trying to get it done. Uh, I've tried mapping out the timing. Probably going to be another year, year and a half, maybe. Um, maybe more. We'll see. <laughs> I'm I'm curious. It's always out. Yep. I'm. Curious about mapping out the timeline because I have tried uh, doing that as well. Uh, sorry, there's a little bar up here that's distracting me. Anyways, um, no I've tried to I've tried mapping out the timeline as well, and it ends up like demotivating me more than anything because it almost always ends up being the case where I'm too ambitious with my timeline. I think that I can get a lot more done than I actually can. Has that been your experience as well? My policy is. 
I, I yeah, I just do it in Excel. I'll uh, kind of break it up into big tasks that I think need to be done, and then break those up into smaller tasks. Guess how much time they'll take, and then usually double the time. And that's kind of my my strategy. So I'd, I'd I'd much rather be way ahead of schedule than way behind. So I usually just way overestimate how long it'll take and give myself ample room uh, and try to give myself a little treat every time I uh, <laughs> complete a task and see that I'm it's a little early. That's actually a really good trick. And I've, um, I, I'm so sorry, by the way, I know we're going off. I, I prepared questions in advance and all that stuff. And we're going off script a little bit here, but you keep saying, yeah, stuff that's, you, you keep saying stuff that's so interesting to me. So you said that you treat yourself a little bit every time you complete something on the timeline. Is that like to kind of, um, obviously you want to reward yourself for, for getting a task done, but is that for like the little bit of a dopamine hit to keep yourself motivated? Does that, do you find that helpful? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, just feels nice to feel like I'm going quickly, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, so I discovered your YouTube channel like uh, a year and a half ago now, probably a little bit more than that. And uh, you've really, really grown since I first found you. Um, so just what's that been like for you? What has it been like uh, working on the game while also working on a YouTube channel as well? Um, and just maybe talk a little bit about the pros and cons of doing YouTube and game dev at the same time. I see. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, definitely takes a lot of time. I think that's the biggest con, uh, is, uh, how long it takes to prepare, edit, uh, you know, form all the videos, especially with, uh, instead of showing my face in the videos, I usually do little doodles and drawings throughout them. There'll be sometimes like 130 drawings per video and they're not you know, very simple and I don't usually reuse them, unfortunately. So it's, I'll spend like a good six hours just drawing <laughs> dumb little doodles. So it takes forever, but, uh, I think it's definitely worth it in terms of the payoff for wish lists and views and interaction and stuff. Yeah. Um, I can, yeah. from an outside perspective, I can tell you that it adds a lot to your videos in terms of, uh, in terms of your branding, but as well as just keeping the stuff really unique and interesting to watch. Um, nice. I assume now, I know a little bit about your background. You're a pixel artist, generally speaking, right? Yeah, I, uh, in high school, I I did like a lot of art. I, I wasn't really in a lot of art classes or anything, but I like to draw a lot. And uh, I got this 100 or 500, a book of 500 prompts, um, just random prompts for drawing. And it's intended for you to draw in that little book, but I decided I wanted to get better at pixel art for eventually making games. So I started doing posting you know daily pixel art with those random prompts it'd be like waterfall so i'd have to draw like a pixel or waterfall or lamp or you know just random stuff so Every that helped me get a lot better. better i bet it did yeah that's awesome yeah, how long I, did you do that I for be really bad uh the 500 days and then an additional like couple hundred where i just drew what i wanted after that okay did you ever um, miss a day uh no but i took a break i got like 30 in and then i decided to stop for like three months and then i went back to it and didn't miss any days wow. but i usually had a backlog i do like like one weekend i did like six so i was always like six ahead just in case i got sick or something that's but. smart actually yeah i i used <laughs> to do that with my videos and i haven't managed to be able to catch back up with uh, doing that yeah so um you have a really interesting past in the in the game dev space as well because i know at one point um and you did a video about it on your channel so i know it's public knowledge you were doing uh indie and free freelance work completely full time um can you just tell us a little bit about that experience and i you told me before this interview that you ended up going back to your full time job just kind of like tell us a little bit about that experience and just kind of what led you to some of those decisions yeah, so uh, I was working full time and I was getting a lot of commissions and I was also selling a fair amount of art prints and I crunched the numbers and found that I could not scrape by, you pretty much scrape by if I uh, sold prints and just did commissions constantly. So uh, I talked to my manager at work and he said, you know, we like you if you want to go try doing art stuff for a little while uh you can always just come back if you want a job again um and so i ended up giving that a shot it, it lasted i think like eight months uh i was just doing constant commissions it was a good like 12 to 14 hours of work a day though of just kind of commission grind which you know it would vary from day to day but the bad days were just constant commission art and then i had to do the print art on top of that and i was i, bu I bought a nice printer i think it's Oh, it's kind of in the background. Uh, 
over here. Um, okay. I was I was cutting and selling prints and stickers and stuff with uh, and shipping them. It was it was a lot. Uh, I think I really like doing pixel art, but doing it just as my constant job, not even eight hours a day, but sometimes longer, and then not having a whole lot of time for the game uh, was kind of uh just not very fun i didn't really enjoy it so i decided i'd rather have a nice clean nine to five that gets me more money and then have tons of free time to work on the game more time. Um, yeah yeah so that's my general advice if anyone's in a similar position i guess if you have the opportunity or i guess the the privilege to have a easy nine to five job that pays well just I think doing that and then doing what you enjoy on the side is probably at least for me the the good move yeah I can <laughs> I can speak from experience a little bit on that front as well because I also I quit my job and I'm doing uh, my YouTube channel and podcast as well as uh, working on the game that I'm working on Samurado and uh, yeah it's making money from you know any venture online is very slow to start and it's a lot of work keeping up with it and um, I'm really determined just me personally i really i don't like having a nine to five and i'm really determined to try to make this work and it's still kind of a bit of like a question mark in terms of whether i can stay where i am um indefinitely or not i think i might be able to but we need to see a little bit more growth so it's it's one of those things where i what i did and what you did it sounds like you wouldn't recommend that other people do it it's kind of like you, you tried it i'm trying it right now and uh it's it's really difficult and it's a lot more work for a lot less pay. So it's just kind of one of those things where if that's something you're thinking about doing, that's something you should probably know before you get into it. And if you're okay with mm -hmm. that, and if you, you know, in my case, I, we sold our house, so I had money to fall back on. Like, it's not like I was, you know, living on the streets or whatever. So everybody's situation is individual, but yeah, I, I think generally speaking for most people, I would go with your advice as well which is work a nine to five and then build your game on the side and do your best that you can with that but you know i don't i, I don't like giving advice to just like because everybody's situation is totally different right, right? so it, it really just yeah. depends on where you're coming from but um anyways th that was a great answer by the way now i just want to move on to the game development process for you specifically um because i'm always interested to know just a little bit about the 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 development process for other people because i only know about my own i kind of work in this really isolated bubble i've got my discord server but like i don't know any other people that i see in real life that work on games so it's always just really cool to to talk to other people about their process uh, because from my perspective your game isle goblin um even from like videos from a long time ago it looks like a polished game that could like mm. just ship any day now um and it, like it looks great so just like that but that's from my perspective and i know that sometimes what you see on the surface it can actually be a bit of a mess underneath so i'm just really curious to know like where is it at where are you at in the development process and just um what has the process been like for you so far i see yeah it's uh in terms of current progress on the game it's got a lot of its core features done like uh i don't know the the underlying farming system where crops will grow in the background or the little livestock system where the the little livestock npcs will i don't know do their thing uh but it's missing just content at this point it's uh, got all those systems so i can kind of finally after a year now test the test the gameplay loop more thoroughly and uh yeah, mostly just waiting on more NPCs, more content, more enemies, more bosses and stuff. Since, you know, it's a very Terraria-esque game, it's very heavy on just kind of content. Um, so mostly just grinding through that at the moment. Uh, in terms of the process, I guess I... Uh, hmm. I... My, my strategy so far has just been get the core elements done as soon as possible so that I can finally test gameplay loop. This is kind of a weird game since I can't really just prototype the gameplay loop in a week because it kind of relies on all these different mechanics which are really complicated. A lot of and different then, systems. Yeah. Yeah, and of course I went ahead and made it multiplayer too, so <laughs> there's been a lot of issues <laughs> issues there. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess, yeah, again, my overall strategy has just been get all the core elements done so I can... Uh, start testing and adding in content so you don't feel like it's it's been thoroughly tested it's really only been tested by you probably or or maybe a handful of other people yeah definitely there i give uh 
access to the builds to people who join the Patreon. Um, so I have a few patrons that have played it, and they test out small little bugs, but they kind of echo the same thing. There isn't a whole lot of purpose to the game yet. It's just kind of a... You can do a lot of stuff, but there's not much point yet, so... Gotcha. You know, not a whole lot of uh, playtesting yet. I'm hoping once I have a demo done in the next couple of months here, uh, I'll be able to send it out to some people for some more you know, thorough testing of the actual game. So in terms of planning, um, getting from where you are right now and getting yourself to where you're at a state where you've got a demo that you feel is really playable and is testable, um, do you have all of that mapped out in some fashion, whether it's on paper or whether it's uh digitally online somewhere like do you have it all mapped out yeah i usually use trello uh just make a ton of little checklist tasks of just tiny things i need to do i found when i freeze up most when i need to think really hard about what to do next so i usually just have like a think sesh where i for three hours just make trello tasks and try to come up with what'll be best and then i can just kind of turn my brain off for three months and just grind through the tasks of drawing and programming and just kind of get things done yep and i i use trello as well actually and um i i'm curious if you do this as well too because what you just said sparks something for me where it's like if you if you get it all out on paper and you get it out of your head it's it's a lot easier to be able to just grind stuff out and i'm wondering because of course as you're going through development process you always wind up with um a whole bunch of ideas that just randomly come to you um at different intervals or you'll encounter different bugs and all of that stuff do you how do you deal with those do you deal with those right away or do you write them down somewhere and kind of like as a to do later type of thing or do you try to store it all in your head what what do you do yeah i have a trello column for to do i have a trello column for bugs and then i have a trello column for nice to haves eventually and uh I think that's uh, kind of it. Uh, but yeah, I have individual columns for bugs and like you said, random ideas because those seem to pop up a lot. <laughs> it's really smart, I think, because I I use Trello as almost like a brain dump for ideas sometimes. I've got one column that's like really long and a lot of it is probably stuff that won't end up making it into the game. But it's like if I don't get them out of my head, and onto either a piece of paper or onto my Trello board somewhere, it's going to be like sitting there in the back of my head and like percolate a little bit and just distract me from my work a little bit. So I always brain dump stuff right as it comes in onto my Trello board so that I can get back to work and focus. Do you, it's that kind of, do you find that helpful? Yeah, that sounds about right. That's pretty much what I do too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, so I actually, um, there's a lot of questions that I get about pressure that especially not just for game developers, but for, but for game developers that also do YouTube as well. There's like, you know, everyone's wondering how do you deal with the pressure of being a game dev? <clears throat> um, because there's this expectation, I think, especially when you're on YouTube and you're doing devlogs, which you are primarily your content is all devlogs on your game. So there must be this element of pressure for you in the back of your head where like your viewers, these 50,000 people that subscribed to watch your stuff, expect progress on your game, right? And if you haven't posted for a couple of months, it's like, oh, where did Matt go? What's he, what's he doing, right? So like, um, how do you, how do you deal with the pressure exactly? And just what, what is that? kind of journey been like for you yeah i think uh in terms of posting i usually set a schedule um for short form content like tiktok youtube shorts and instagram i usually try to do once a week uh and then youtube it's a strict every two months it used to be every one month but i decided to back it off to posting one video every two months so i'd have more content per video and uh uh, have more time since it takes so much time to edit the videos it it's kind of a waste so i try to minimize doing that as much as possible but uh yeah it's sometimes i'll kind of hit a, hit a devlog point and not have a ton to talk about uh well i guess most of the devlogs have been okay this next one that i'm gonna I haven't started editing it yet. I've got a devlog in two weeks. And since I've mostly finally started adding content, there's not really a ton to show. It's not very, uh, everything, everything previously has been very kind of cinematic by nature, you know, adding farming or adding world, you know, world generation. Like that's really fun to watch, but writing NPC dialogue and I don't know, I, I maybe animated a couple bosses that might be interesting to see, but I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, so yeah, the pressure can be uh, a bit much sometimes, but 
I, I honestly don't think it's too bad. And even if I don't post for a little while, I think people generally kind of forget. I don't know. Like I, I haven't posted on I haven't posted on TikTok for a few months and there's plenty of stuff on TikTok to keep people happy. If if they don't see me for a few months, then maybe in a few months they'll, they'll I'll finally post and they'll say, Oh, it's the goblin guy again. But it's not like they're at least most people aren't, you know, worrying about it too much. Uh, I guess some of the more active people in the Discord or whatever might ping me and say, Where's the video? But in general I think uh I think people are a little not and they are not as focused on it as I think they are, you know. I think that's a really healthy mindset to have because it's definitely true. Um, you know, it's uh, except for maybe in the Silk Song community. <laughs> but, yeah, there you go. You know, they, they're their own. Uh, that's their yeah. they've got their own thing going on there. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's a really healthy outlook on it all because um, I think it, it at least happens for me where I can get it in my head where it's like, oh, people are like waiting for this stuff because I said I'm going to post it every X number of days or whatever. And I don't really think that that's the case. People just kind of expect, you know, whenever you release something, oh, that's awesome. I love this guy's content. I'll watch it. And, you know, whenever you release something else, it's, hey, cool, whatever. If you need a break, that's cool. Um, yeah, I find the community for game development to be very understanding very compassionate and very forgiving like you say you need a break you say you're burning out um people are generally very supportive i've seen all sorts of stuff about that and it's just I, i'm really glad to hear that that's kind of the page that you're on because i think if you let that kind of pressure build up that's where burnout is going to come into play and uh we'll, we'll get into that i'm sure in a little bit here but uh i i want to get back to development though because you sound like you're you're, you're in that place where, okay, your core systems are done, um, which is really exciting because now it's like add more content, add more content and kind of get it into that playable state. So when you are closer to being comfortable to, you know, when you're in a place where you're a little bit closer to being ready to release it, um, have you given any thoughts to doing a Kickstarter, um, early access, going with a publisher, like any of these kind of options that you might have at your disposal? What, just where's your head at with all of that? Yeah, so uh, my general thought process has been try not to think about it until I have a demo ready just because uh, I don't want to stress about it too much. And uh, I don't know, a, a publisher would, from what I, I don't know, I, I don't want to come to a publisher with a demo. Um, so I've just decided not to think about it until until then. Plus, uh, I might have a better sense by then of whether I need help with localization or need help with uh, social media or whatever. Um so try, I've been trying not to think about it, I guess. Uh, but of course I do anyway. So uh, I, I might end up with a publisher for, I think there were a few things I needed help with. Uh, localization, maybe I might be able to handle that. But uh, the big ones were reaching out to YouTubers and streamers. Um, and then, uh, shoot, I, there was something else. Console ports. Console ports were a yes. big one. I, yeah. I haven't, uh, I've never touched that, so I'm scared of it. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Uh, and just for those people who are listening that don't know what it is, could you tell them what localization means? Uh, yeah, just uh, translating the game, I suppose, uh, making the game readily available in other languages and other cultures as well, to an extent. Yeah, um, that would be a lot to do by yourself. I don't, I remember Jonas Tyroller did a video on that with uh, with yeah. with his game, and he ran into a little bit of trouble with with, like, I guess there's some legal stuff you need to worry about that he didn't know about beforehand. So yeah, it's uh, that is something where I think a publisher would come in very handy. So that's that's really smart. Um, all right. So my experience with game dev is, um, and I'm curious to see if it's the same for you. For me, it's hard to market to gamers. Uh, that's kind of like, and I see this conversation in my Discord server all the time. It's how do you market to gamers? Because t marketing to game developers is kind of easy. There's a lot of stuff on Twitter that's already built around that. Even doing devlogs and all of that stuff, it's kind of, at least I feel like it's more targeted towards game developers, people who are interested in game development rather than actual gamers. So um, do you feel like, you know, like the fact that devlogs and Twitter posts that, you know, like um, what... It, what are those every Wednesday things that you end up doing on Twitter? It's like 
that you do screenshot Saturday and wish list oh, yeah. Wednesday and, and all that stuff yeah. on Twitter. It's all very, you know, so you end up with this massive post with a whole bunch of indie developers that are maybe wish listing each other's stuff, but it's not gamers aren't going to be looking at that. Right. So, um, yeah. so do you feel like the fact that all of this stuff that a lot of people focus on and it's targeting game developers, not gamers, do you feel like that's a problem necessarily for indie game developers and, just do you plan to do anything to kind of market your game to gamers or are you already? Um, and if so, what are you doing to do that? Yeah, I've tried lots of stuff. I tried some of the Twitter stuff. I I, I don't know why. I've never really done very well at Twitter. Uh, but Same. <laughs> I've tried. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've tried. Uh, my original strategy was, OK, I have this pixel art background. I like my I think I have a cute style for the game. My original plan was. Uh, I'm going to each week, in addition to the devlogs, um, draw kind of a little scene in the style of the game from something else. So for example, Adventure Time, I would draw like a little, I'd draw the little Adventure Time house with Finn and Jake in front of it. Uh, and I'd animate it so they're kind of bopping like uh, in the little animation style of the game. Then I could go sneak into the Adventure Time subreddit and post it there and say, hey everyone, uh, here's a drawing in the style of my game, here's the link. Uh, and I could kind of you know it, it would work better for other games like uh i guess adventure time was a bad example but if i were to do uh i don't know stardew valley i did it for stardew valley i could sneak into the stardew valley subreddit and say you know here's uh here's stardew valley in my style for my game which is over here so then i could hopefully kind of steal from this current audience of gamers and kind of inject them into my my own game but uh it didn't really work i did probably like 30 of those things uh and it didn't get me a ton of wish lists i thought it was really clever but it didn't really work out i was um, gonna say it sounds really clever yeah it, uh, it didn't really pay off i even got to the front page of the stardew valley subreddit uh and it didn't even i it got like 100 uh, you know like nothing major um it, it didn't really pay off but uh then from that i kind of refocused on the devlogs that my devlogs were very like i don't know it'd be like it'd be titled like devlog 3 adding livestock to my game and that's a that's a video that's going to attract mostly other developers yes. um but i've tried to kind of switch it to something that i as a gamer would be more interested in uh i guess one of the recent ones was i think i titled it something like i'm making a terraria stardew hybrid clone i was just trying to pitch the game as easily as i could on youtube to somebody who might click on it and say i like terraria i like stardew let me click on this and see if the game looks fun uh, I've been trying to angle the videos more towards that, and then I've been really reducing the the technical content of the videos. In my early videos, I'd talk about all my uh, all the algorithms and stuff, and now I like I might loosely talk about it, but I mostly just kind of say, "Here's a new feature. Here's a new feature. Here's a new feature," and kind of just focus on the features of the game instead of going into the more devloggy talk. At least the, the most recent couple of videos, um, and I think that's worked pretty well. I think the wish lists have shot up a little more, and then on top of that, I think TikTok is kind of the way to go. Uh, I've had just crazy wish lists from TikTok. That's my, uh, that's kind of the money maker, I think. Um, just posting little clips of the game of, here's my game, uh, here's the idea, uh, and here's some new feature that I added and people eat it up. I think uh, I, I, I'm, I've been having a lot of success with the short form content and I think that's uh, kind of my way forward. I that's so funny that you bring that up because we actually just created our own TikTok account today. <laughs> I've been I, I've been hearing a lot that I should have a TikTok account and it's one of those things where it's like, oh my God, it's just another thing that I need to do. But I, I do think for the game, for specifically for the game, that it will end up being worth it. So I'm really glad to hear you say that because that really validates that for me. Um, nice. In terms of the YouTube devlog stuff, um, do you let the YouTube algorithm just handle it and try to find people? Or do you also go on Reddit and post it in different places? Um, do you have any tips that you want to give people in terms of doing good YouTube videos? Because your stuff, some of your videos have like really gotten a lot of views. Well, thanks. Yeah, I don't really promote it elsewhere. Uh, I found that doesn't uh, really do much for me, even posting it on my own Instagram. I, I mean, from all my pixel art days, I have about, I've, I think over a hundred thousand followers on Instagram, but only like 200 will click if I post it on my story. So I, it's hard, it's hard to get external clicks. I think the, the YouTube algorithm kind of has to do its magic, but I think it does its job. Well, when I have a video that I think is a banger, it usually does pretty good. And when I have a video and I watch it and I think, eh, this is just okay. Then usually it just does okay. So I, I think the algorithm is pretty good. Um, and I guess in terms of YouTube tips, I'd say 
I think my videos got a lot better once I started doing TikToks. Uh, I my TikTok, you know, you just have to cram so much into such a small video to treat those tiny attention spans, and you just have to have such a good hook at the beginning, and you have to have something funny at the end so that people will comment, or something interesting at the end so people will comment and say, "What was that at the end?" or or they'll comment about it and you get that interaction or they'll think that was funny. I'll like this or I don't know, just kind of those little things that because I, I did terrible on TikTok at first. So, you know, I, I was kind of Googling little tips and tricks to do better. And I starting up to apply those to the videos, uh, I think, helped a lot. Like, uh, I guess, general video tips. Uh, I, I, I've seen people online say, you know, you have to have your hook within the first 10 seconds. And so I try to have some question that is unanswered within the first 10 seconds of the video like uh uh hmm, i don't know uh, i don't know about an example kind of kind of bring something up and say like you know i added this new thing i'll show you in a second and then kind of talk about the game talk about what it is give them the exposition so the, give them a reason to stick around like if i just kind of jump in and say hey i'm matt i'm working on this game you know they might lose interest but if i say i just added this cool new feature by the way i'm matt i'm working on this game you know they're going to stick around and kind of want to see that new feature and then Hope when you do finally show that yeah when you do finally show that at the three minute mark then tease something else for the six minute mark you know just always have some lingering reason where they're desperate to stay because they want to see something um that's and then uh, awesome advice. i guess <laughs> and then another thing I guess is kind of bait interaction if you can like I usually say um, I usually say something like uh, make sure you leave a comment I read every single comment and then I get those people that say you know I bet you didn't read this and then there <laughs> I got my interaction <laughs> so you know anything you can do to kind of get some uh, get them to click in any way even even just halfway through the video saying by the way if you like it helps the YouTube algorithm like uh, you know just Anything you can do YouTube, I think helps a lot. YouTube shorts versus TikToks. Do you end up reusing any content between the two? Is there any time saving stuff that, or do you really just focus more heavily on TikTok? I usually focus on TikTok and Instagram reels. I, uh, I guess my problem is I'll post on TikTok every week and it'll kind of cover content that's going to be in the next devlog. And then the next devlog rolls around and so if I were to post those on YouTube shorts, I would kind of be showing stuff that's going to be in a devlog. And then I don't know, I, I've i avoided YouTube shorts. I don't know if I should, but I've, I've kind of been avoiding posting there since they're going to see it in a devlog in two months anyway. So gotcha. I usually just focus on TikTok and Reels. I, I don't know if I should post on shorts. I've, I'm just, I, I guess, honestly, I've been a little lazy, but uh, <laughs> I, I think you sh I think people should post on all three and just reuse the content. Okay. Um. I want to ask you about a game that you you actually you took a little break from Isle Goblin to work on a game called This Is Hell, right? Um, and it's it's published on Steam. Um, it's just a little bit of a detour from your game. I can't remember the exact details behind it, but I think I think that was during the time that you were uh, full time doing all of your all your stuff, and you were trying to figure out how to make some revenue for yourself. Um, just really curious because I know that's a very popular idea that gets thrown around like, Hey, let's try to make a really, really short game and maybe we'll make a little bit of money. How did that experience go for you? And was it worth it? Um, yeah. Yeah. That was my, uh, right at the end of my freelance, uh, saga, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, I decided I wanted to try, yeah, just making something as quickly as I could. I was kind of burning out with, uh, the Isle Goblin concept. I, I I was going in a different direction before then. Uh, it was going to be kind of like a, a turn-based thing. Like it was really different, um, and I wasn't liking it. I finally got all the core features done, and I kind of hated it. Um, like it was okay. I, I think it was a very okay game, but and the the road to improving it was very long, and uh, I just wasn't super invested in the idea, and it wasn't really something I would have loved to play. So I decided, okay, I'm going to take a break from this. I was also a little concerned, I guess, about the the steam release process so i decided okay i'm gonna take a break i'm gonna try to make something and just see how it does uh, i'm gonna try put, making daily tiktoks for it and just uh, see how many wish lists i can get and maybe it'll roll into something nice uh, and it'll, it'll at least be a good experience so i grinded that out that was uh a lot of work i think i just worked on it constantly without any breaks for the month just i totally burned myself out just uh grinding to the bone but uh i ended up with like i think maybe 2000 ish wish list 2100 over the month uh which i think was pretty good for a month um in the end though it only made me about ten dollars an hour i think for the amount of time that i spent on it so 
it wasn't worth it money wise, but uh, I think it was great in terms of gaining confidence with releasing on Steam, gaining confidence on releasing and finishing something. It taught me how to like kind of put aside all those little random things I wanted to add. Like I had to make a list of things that I could finish in a month and then any other little side ideas, they had to be good or they weren't going to make it. So now I'm a little less scared to leave things out. Um, it showed me how hard it is to get YouTubers and streamers to respond to you on email. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it was a good experience. Um, I, it's not very fun. Uh, it's very hard. You know, it, 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 it's a rage game. So, you know, like kind of like a getting over it type uh, type game where it's just very hard. Uh, so, you know, it it's not great, but <laughs> it was a fun little project. Yeah. Well, yeah, 2100 wish list is uh, that's really good for a month. <laughs> Uh, but that sounds like that would have been a lot of work. So you're grinding out the game and you released a daily TikTok. Um, that's, yeah, yeah. that, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah, it was a lot. Luckily the, the, I think TikTok usually, uh, I can edit a video or, you know, record, edit and finish a video in like 40 minutes. So uh, there's no little drawings in those. So those are quick. Uh, I, I really like the TikToks cause they're just so fast to make. I wanted um, to, I wanted to ask, so let's say so you get this idea in your head i want to make a game in a month um how long was the actual whole process and i mean including uh were there any bug fixes or patches that you had to do after the fact um like was it actually just a month-long process or was you know from start to actual end where you're like all right i'm done this game no more work on this game i'm moving back to isle goblin was it like a two-month process just yeah yeah i think it was like let's see I think it was a month to get uh, the game done. Uh, shoot. I spent another 15 days, uh, I think, doing bug fixes, getting the release ready, porting it to iOS and just iOS. Um, what else did I do? I was posting more videos during that time. I, yeah, so I guess it was like 45 days worth of TikToks. Um, and then I was also getting the YouTube video ready. I thought the YouTube video would help me a lot. I only got like 10,000 views on that video for the for a good couple months. Uh, I was That was a good video too. I think that was one of my best videos. But uh, I remember it. It was good. Yeah. Thank you. I I was happy with it, but it didn't, it didn't do very well. The YouTube algorithm, I guess, failed me. But uh, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Um, so I think it was like 45 days-ish maybe, but I think... The game was pretty much done by day 30. I don't think there was much else to add. Uh, yeah, maybe some minor bug fixes. There weren't a lot of bugs. It was pretty. Uh, it was a pretty simple game. Okay. Um, just for context, before I ask my next question, are so you learned you were good at art before you started game development? Like you kind of were. Uh, you you did a 500 day pixel art challenge and all that stuff. Was that that was before you got into game development? Is that correct? Yeah, that was before I got into game development. I was doing those drawings. I just liked the pixel art style. Uh, I uh, was doing that, and then I had a friend in my statistics class in high school, and he he was a big Unity guy. He he's right now he's doing his PhD in like uh, I don't know some sort of rendering. He works at AMD. He's like uh, really a hardcore into rendering stuff. But anyways, he uh, he reached out and he told me he did Unity. So we decided to make a little dumb game together. And that was kind of my introduction to Unity. He did all the coding. And I just animated stuff. He did everything else. Uh, but it got me comfortable like with Unity's UI to an extent. And so eventually when that, of course, crumbled and fell apart because we didn't know what we were doing, uh, we uh, I, I, I gave it a shot on my own. And I probably tried like six projects just bumbling through it, trying to figure out how to use Unity and how to code because I wasn't really much. I, I took like AP computer science in high school it didn't even do very well on the AP test. And I don't know, I had like two programming classes in college with, you know, just C. So I, I had a lot to learn. So I come up, kind of bumbled through little dumb projects that didn't work out and uh, eventually landed here, I guess. Cool. All right. Um, so with your background, then I'm, I'm always curious to hear what are your um, favorite parts of making games and what are your least favorite parts? Because I'm um, everyone's always different in terms of what parts they like and there's always everybody's always got some stuff that they really freaking hate working on and i'm just curious as to what those are for you yeah i found i really like well i guess if we narrow in on art stuff i really like uh animating like really intense 
stuff like i don't know like a, a boss transformation that's all grotesque i love that that's really fun but doing like oh man like just the eight direction idle animations for an enemy and then doing it for another enemy and then doing it for the character and then doing it for the character in armor where it's just constantly repeating the same little pixel art drawings for step, 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 step. It's just, I, I get so tired of it. Um, and I guess from a programming perspective, I, I really hate learning new tools like, uh, I don't know, say I need to, I discover I need to use compute shaders for something to make it quicker. And I've never used a compute shader before. I, I hate the process of just reading through documentation or trying to understand it. And, but I, but I love on the flip side, having all the little tools in my toolbox to use. So, uh, yeah, I guess learning new things isn't especially fun, but it's really fun to know new, to know lots of things. So, yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, so I, I feel like this next one is really important to talk about because doing game dev and YouTube at the same time, um, especially when you're working on devlogs, for some people that are on the outside, it can create this uh, this kind of warped perception in terms of what game development is actually like. Um, for the sake of YouTube, for example, uh, you might need to focus more on polish and like actual graphics up front than you otherwise would if you're working on a game like completely solo in the dark. You're not posting anything about it online, all that stuff, because for YouTube's sake, people respond to, you know, actual interesting stuff to look at on the screen, right? So your area of focus is going to end up being different when you do things on YouTube than you otherwise would by yourself. So um, does doing YouTube and game dev at the same time for you uh, change things in terms of how you approach working on your games? Would you work on it differently if you weren't doing devlogs and you were just making Isle Goblins and that's it? Yeah, I think uh, especially up until now, uh, it wouldn't really change much. I think uh, I've just been lucky and most of the stuff I've been working on has naturally been kind of fun to watch. Um, but yeah, right now I'm kind of thinking about that. I've been wondering if I should kind of, you know, change things up and intentionally do things that are more interesting to look at so that when I do have devlogs... Uh, I have something to show because right now, honestly, I don't have much to show for this next video in two weeks. So I don't know. I think I might, instead of changing how I go about the game stuff, I think I might just do a different style of video. Like, you know, I've seen a lot of day in the life videos uh, from other developers. Um, of course, those are more targeted at other developers. So I don't know. I'll have to think about it and see if there's some other video that might uh, make sense. But I, I don't really want to change uh, how I go about doing the game just to make it intentionally interesting to watch okay gotcha uh so i'm i'm curious for you um because game development can get really really difficult it can be you know it can hit you in a lot of different ways it can make you feel stupid it can it can you know it's gonna hit you in a lot of weird emotional ways um because you're, you're coding you're doing art and you're just you're failing constantly you're doing little micro failures and then you fix it and you make it a little better and then you try something else and you probably fail again or maybe you get it on your first try but then you're always failing right so it's really it's a very challenging process so and even apart from that you're doing youtube so you might get a nasty comment on one of your videos or um or you're, you're trying to implement something and it's just you can't seem to figure it out it's just not working and maybe you you know you sat down to work on Isle Goblin for a couple hours and you finish the day and like literally nothing has changed like there are hard days like that so what do you do on those days how do you keep going um what helps you really push through all of the negative all the negativity especially on really difficult days like that yeah I think uh that's a good question what keeps me yeah what keeps me engaged in this very punishing exercise i guess uh, <laughs> yeah uh yeah because it takes a lot of time too uh i my social life has definitely taken a huge hit since i'm constantly saying no to things so that i have time to work on this game so <laughs> i'd say in general hmm yeah i guess okay so narrowing in on just comments i've noticed uh the really mean comments like this sucks or this looks stupid like those ones, I, you know, you can kind of ignore to an extent. It's just, uh, it's just mean people, sad people being mean. But it's the 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 comments that have a little truth to them that are just kind of more critical. Those are the ones that really like, really bite me. It's like, yeah. uh, 
they'll be like, uh, I don't know. I, it's hard to think of an example, but something like, uh, you know, oh, the game looks okay, but uh, I think this is kind of a huge problem that you haven't addressed. Like, those are the ones that I'm like, oh, well, maybe they're right. But I don't know. I guess just trying to be critical about it and think, okay, this is a, a criticism. I should just treat it as such. And is it accurate? If so, what can we do to address that and try to make a little action plan and throw it on the Trello? Uh, that, that's kind of the strategy for those. Try not to take it personally, I guess, is kind of the big thing. But in terms of... Yeah, just the game just punishing me for existing and, uh, you know, just being mean to me uh, when, <laughs> when it doesn't work. Or uh, I'd say just the the overall motivation that keeps me going is the existential dread of <laughs> working a nine to five until I retire. If I'm ever thinking like, oh, maybe I should just stop doing this. Then I go back to imagining myself just sitting in my desk until I'm, you know, 60 or whatever uh, in you know review meetings all all day i just i i can't do it and so that's more terrifying is that right yeah absolutely <laughs> this this is this is my this is my golden light at the end of the tunnel even though it's uh it's incredibly unlikely that you know i don't know i'm doing everything i can to you know eventually be able to do this full time but uh i know it's unlikely but it's my it's my glimmer of hope it's my unlikely glimmer of hope i'm the same way i <laughs> we're brother in arms here i can i can relate well sad. very much <laughs> it's it, uh, people talk about how punishing it is but you know the flip side to everything you're saying is that you know if you if you can create this thing and make it full-time then it's even if you can't make it full-time you know releasing a game in and of itself is incredibly rewarding and i guess so is what you're trying to say then that pushing through all of this stuff is worth it because it's just it, it it's worth it because of that reward at the end. Like, holy shit, I made a freaking game. Like, that's incredible. Definitely, yeah. And then uh, even the little victories, like when something finally works and, you know, you're running around and it starts to feel like a game or a little enemy AI actually looks like it's intelligent and you don't just see it as a bunch of uh, your your commands. That, I don't know, just when it, when it starts to come to life, that's when it's really, yeah, very rewarding and it's, it, it's finally worth it. Feels like magic, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so... What advice would you give to a developer who's like just starting? This is their very first day that like they're listening and today they decide, okay, today, literally right now, I want to start game development. Um, and let's say they come to you and they ask like, hey, I'm just starting out. What do I need to know? Um, how do I do this and how do I do it well? I want I want to be like you, Matt. How do I how do I get there? What advice would you give them? Mm, I see. Yeah, I'd, hmm, that's tough. I'd probably uh i could probably talk to them for hours about uh <laughs> where to go even though i mean you know i'm not necessarily successful yet so i, I don't want to lead anybody astray but uh i'd say yeah that's tough i guess just everybody everybody online says start small with a uh small project you know start with like pong or tic-tac-toe or something really easy uh i think that you should definitely do a few of those um just to kind of get used to unity and then I'd say just try your big ridiculous idea um, and just go for it and it'll probably inevitably crumble and fail. And then I'd say after that one, um, kind of go back, plan everything out. You kind of have a sense of, okay, here's what went wrong. Uh, you know, I, I kind of have a sense of all these smaller little pieces. Can I you know, try to come up with an actual actionable plan where you know every step of the process and build up that list of steps and I guess come up with a more reasonable game idea that's just reduced scope and then cut the scope in half again after that and then finally you'll be ready to I guess start posting about it and uh, making videos that's what I would tell myself at least if I could go back in time is do a bunch of little project try your big one learn from that and then go try something that's actually maybe a little more reasonable uh, and then you can for that you can start doing all your posts and stuff so you don't embarrass yourself with the uh, uh, the previous attempts that's that's what I would tell myself okay that's interesting I, I like that approach because it's it's realistic because you're right all the advice that you see online is you know start with really really small projects and then what I hear a lot is don't go for your big game idea but the thing is, nobody listens to that advice. Everyone's like, oh, well, I'm special. I, I can do it, right? Everybody everybody thinks, you know, everyone's the hero of their own story. So they're, you end up inevitably 
going against that advice that you hear and you go for a big project and maybe you fail or maybe you don't. But I, I like what you're saying because that is what most people are going to do. And yeah, so you're taking the whole learn from your failures approach, which I'm very pro that approach, 100%. Yeah, I think especially with the uh, like structure of all the coding too. I, you know, I did a few small projects, but it wasn't until the big one where I learned, oh, I made a huge issue not using interfaces or I made a huge issue not uh, making this more modular. Kind of, it, it wasn't until I really tried to make something huge that I realized I need to do better with my coding practice. So just overall, I th yeah, I think that's the way, but that everyone's makes, different. Yep. Yep. That makes, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I want to thank you again so much for joining me here. And I want to encourage every single person who's watching every single person who's listening, um, you know, go check out Watt Designs uh, YouTube channel. It's fantastic. But more importantly, go to Steam and go look for Isle Goblin and Wishlist. I want to get this guy, you know, up to the top 100 indie games. So um, go and wishlist his game. It's uh, if you haven't watched a devlog, it's it it's looking really fantastic. Like this guy's really really talented. This is advice that you want to listen to. This guy knows what he's doing. Twenty thousand wishlists that he's already accumulated is you know double the goal that most people are going for so that's a really big deal like i know that you said you don't want to lead people astray but the fact that you're already there and you're shooting for 50 like that's that's huge like i don't know what that's going to translate to be in terms of like revenue per hour working on this game that would be really hard to calculate but i expect you're going to launch with a very very successful game and i i can't wait to see the day so uh thank you again and i do i just want to give you an opportunity if you had any closing thoughts or anything that you would like to say before we switch off here i just want to open the floor to you to let you do that if you so choose nice well thank you yeah um i guess hmm, uh, if i wanted to say anything i guess i would say that uh if I, I I appear like I know what I'm doing in the videos, like I'm I'm very much like talking like I know exactly what I'm doing, like and then I implemented this because this and this and that. I don't know what I'm talking about, so <laughs> just I, yeah, the uh, don't let the imposter syndrome get you. Nobody knows what the all these indie game developers that act like they know exactly what they're doing. Nobody knows what they're doing, so just just give it a shot. Post your videos, act confident. You'll be fine. That's my that's my advice. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That also validates me as well. Yeah, seriously, I, I can I can second that. I've been doing this for several years as well myself, and I still feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. So you're 100% right, um, and I think it's the same for everybody. So don't let the imposter syndrome get you. Thank you so much for those closing thoughts. And uh, all right, man. Thank you so much, and we'll talk soon.